life stories. All of our lives are stories. All of those stories have an arc to them. And if we're lucky, those stories have a sequel. My story starts out at eight, as an eight-year-old in PS206 library, spread over, out over my lap are National Geographic magazines. And I'm looking at the pictures of the people in the magazine and saying, will I ever meet them? Uh, what do I have in common with them? What's important to them? Fast forward a little bit, and now I'm 15 years old, and I'm sitting in Miss Whitlock's English class, and I'm reading about and learning about the British treatment of Indians during the colonial period. And I'm thinking, I'm fascinated by the racism, repulsed by it. I'm saying, what, what would I do if I were in that situation? Some things I'm also concluding are that cartoons are fabulous for looking at complex issues, cutting through them, remembering something because it made you smile or laugh. A couple of other things I've concluded. Life is mutually satisfying relationships and memorable meals. That's it. I'm very comfortable with ambiguity and have a high tolerance for risk. Three quick examples. I flew into Biafra during the Nigerian Civil War. I accompanied 10 tons of salted codfish, and I had strapped to my waist $20,000 that I was smuggling in. I flew, I flew in on Jesus Christ Airlines. I flew in because it was a humanitarian mission, because in that conflict, starvation was used as a weapon of war, a totally unacceptable, repulsive idea. I took over the directorship of the Children's Museum when it was five weeks away from going out of business. And left eight years later, we're putting it where it is now on I-25, <clears throat> and developing an earned income approach that later on was called social enterprise. It is now practiced in countries around the world. And three, getting closer to today, 13 years ago, started the Milestones Project with my wife. Started it because weekly headlines, think about last week's headlines in Pakistan, showed about one group of, being, of, of, of people being unkind, uncharitable, even intolerant and violent towards another, purely on the basis of some superficial characteristic, skin color, eye shape, and making judgments about those and creating distance between them and, and, and the other group. What we decided to do was, we thought, very simple. We would use photography as a medium to show what we have in common. We would photograph 19 shared milestones, developmental milestones that just make us human. We go to 10 countries, and we go from there. Well, there are a couple of little problems in that conclusion. One is, we didn't know anything about photography. And secondly, we had no money. So we did what principal people do. We refinanced their house and used the equity to get started. And we never looked back. We decided that we would take two paths. One is that we would develop resource materials for thoughtful parents and educators. And we would take those messages of inclusion and acceptance and hope and put them in unusual locations where a lot of people could see them. Airports, town centers. We got started. The Milestones project, uh, book appeared. We looked at 11 of those milestones. We concluded that We will lose our first tooth by eight. We will grow our first tooth by one. We'll get a best friend, first best friend, a first sibling. We'll go to school by, by eight. We'll get our first shot at the doctor. These are milestones that we all go through, regardless of where we live. 
our income level. We also stumbled upon three universal expressions of childhood. And as we were doing this, we found ourselves with extraordinary people joining our team. J.K. Rawlings, Eric Carle wrote for the Milestones book. They wrote about their milestones. And children, 2,000 children from 13 countries wrote about theirs. And extraordinarily, they used the same words almost exactly. We stumbled on these three universal expressions of childhood. When children stick their t tongues out, they're either concentrating or goofing off or concentrating. They choose hats that are an extension of themselves and they wear them forever. And faces. We took photographs of faces now in 33 countries. Faces that show delight, happiness, beautiful faces, but also sadness and fear. The exhibition started up here, here in Denver. Then it went to Heathrow Airport, and now a total of 11 international airports. Over 200 million people have seen those messages that promote respect, understanding, inclusion, and acceptance. A first Latin American exhibit two years ago was opened by the vice president of the country who was last year's one of finalists for a Nobel Prize. We've been honored with invitations to have our pictures on display on a permanent basis. Now there are 37 locations worldwide. Here in Children's Hospital, 30, 42 pictures were commissioned because we were told they're uplifting. They provide a sense of hope and possible possibilities. We reissued the book, the Milestones book, with a soft cover edition and something else. We added an ethical growth chart because we believe that children grow at two dimensions, not just physically, but ethically. And we wanted to be an ally of parents so they could record both dimensions of their child's development. We produced three board books, the Chewable series for children zero to three. And with Denver's Head Start program, two bilingual workbooks. And we conceived of a pledge that parents weekly tell us they read at night with their children and teachers tell us they start the day with. A pledge to notice the ways we are alike before I notice the ways that we are different. A pledge to use kind and respectful words to work out any differences we might have. In 2007, a thunderbolt hit us. The discussions about immigration became ugly, we think racist. Prejudices were thrown around like darts. What we decided to do, because we're really not good bystanders, was to take, tell the story of 27 men and women who chose to live in Littleton, who brought their children and entrusted them in the schools, who brought their entrepreneurial spirit, the resources to start businesses. They all said the same thing which we heard in other countries anywhere we went. I want hope and possibilities in my life. I want a life that's better for my children. And that's why I'm here. A third area of interest, faith, came about because of headlines like last week's Pakistan incidents. A group of pilgrims would go to a, to a shrine and they'd be attacked on a train. The train would be set on fire. People would die. Horrible things would happen. The next week there would be retaliation. We said, what are we going to do about this? What can we do about this? Who's looking at the commonality of faiths? What they share. They all have a teacher, a guide, they call them different things, an imam, a rabbi, a priest, a pastor, but they all serve the same function. 
The function is to be a guide to help people navigate through their faith. They all have a sacred text that set out the rules, the prescriptions for behavior of people who are, who are adherents to that faith. They all, the exhibit appeared at the, first in England, opened by Prince Charles, and then came to the Colorado Convention Center, where in seven months, 800,000 people saw these messages of commonality. Many people would stand in front of the picture. They go one to the other to the other and say, I never thought about it that way. The staff of the convention center would sometimes come off their breaks and, and cry in front of those pictures. It never occurred to me was what we heard most often. That there followed shared joys and sorrows. We thought, who's talking about those common sh joys and sorrows of the three Abrahamic faiths and their followers? 33 families later, 3,100 photographs later, eight countries represented. We concluded you're no happier if you're a first-time grandmother, if you're Jew, Christian, or Muslim. Every one of those faiths, those three, cherish children and want their children to learn about charity and generosity and introduce their children to the faith. The exhibit opened at the Englewood Civic Center and once again people went from picture to picture and said, I had no idea. They all had a golden rule. The words were a little different, but it was the same golden rule. The next area of wisdom came up by accident, but it, our conclusion was two things. Wisdom is in all our heads. It's an Arabic statement. And each generation has something to teach and to learn from the other generation. Extraordinary people agreed with us. Bishop Tutu, Jane Goodall, Walter Cronkite. And these people wrote original writings, shared their wisdom, including Tom Hanks. Our fifth era of interest happened again by accident because of an invitation to go to Calgary and tell the stories of extraordinary people who had one thing in common they had special needs. And what we found there was the same dynamics at play. People were being marginalized purely on the basis of some external characteristic. Judgments were being made about them simply because they looked different from we, from us. Take Alan, for instance. Alan is a quadriplegic, but said, wait a second. My brain's intact, I have some mobility in my hands. Why can't I manage the database for the Calgary Symphony Orchestra? And he does. Then there's Ariel, five years old. We came upon Ariel dancing in a, in a dance studio with her tutu, delighting people, thrilling people. She doesn't know that she had Down syndrome at birth. She doesn't know that at two years old, she had a vicious form of leukemia, couldn't even lift her legs. In her mind, she's going to be a ballerina. We have no right, no one has a right to diminish that dream, that hope, that aspiration. In four days, we will premiere our digital platform. It's called In Common Images. Two quick messages. One is, we all underestimate our creativity and talents, especially in photography. And two, given a chance, people will use their gifts to raise money for worthwhile charities worldwide. And that's what In Common Images will do. Let me finish with three very personal stories. They involve grandchildren. Sutton is 13 now. A few months ago on her birthday, she invited her friends to the party. And she said, please bring a gift. 
not for me. I've researched a children's home in, in Denver, and I'd like to donate all of our gifts to that home. There's Max. He's now 11. But at five years old, he said to his parents, I have enough stuff. Here's what I want for Christmas. I want a snowflake. I want an avocado. I want a slice of pizza. And mom, I got to get you a new cell phone. And then there's Maddie. Maddie who thinks hard and deeply about everything. She's now 13, but 11 years old, she did a report on Marian Anderson, the singer. And she wrote something down that she said, Papa, which she calls me, I think you're going to like this. And I did. Ms. Anderson said, when I sing, I don't want people to see the color of my skin, which is black. I want them to see my soul, and that is colorless. Three final points. You know that legacy I mentioned, the sequel in your lives? Those are the kids you touch every day as, as teachers. Those are your children. They watch you like hawks. They want to make sure the words match the deeds. They breathe in your values. They carry them forward. They're your legacy. Secondly, if you lead a, a life that has purpose and meaning baked in, at the end of the day, you're going to be far happier, more satisfied than people who dedicate their lives to acquiring things. And if you use your life in the promotion of mutual respect, understanding, acceptance, inclusion, and empathy for others, Lace up your running shoes. You're in for a marathon, not a sprint. And you know something? It's worth it. Enjoy the run. Thank you. Thank you very much.